the Society has always centered its annual Black History Month activities around the themes established by Asala. This year's Black History Month theme is the Black Family, Representation, Identity, and Diversity. Today's program and other society programs throughout the month of February will address this theme. We hope you will enjoy and be inspired by them. As is our custom and tradition, we'll begin with an invocation which will be given by Pastor Kirk Davis, who's affiliated with Kairos Fellowship in the city's Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood. The invocation will be followed by the singing of the Negro National Anthem by the Third Baptist Church Singers under the musical direction of Reverend James Smith, where Reverend Amos Brown is the senior pastor. Hello, everyone. This is amazing. This is a great time. I'm thankful for being a part of this. My name is Pastor Kirk Davis. I am a part of Cairo's Fellowship in the Bayview Hunters Point, and I want to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, let me start by just saying that one of my monikers, one of the things that I say all the time, that life is a beautiful mess. Come on, I know somebody's with me. That life could be the most beautiful thing in the world and maybe sometimes the most messiest. Uh, that life sometimes brings us hard stuff. And some of us have been through some hard things in the past year. And I want to just say, I am praying, we are praying, and we love you, and we are with you. So with that being said, we want to celebrate this beautiful, beautiful Black History Month with you. And so my job tonight is, uh, or this afternoon, or this evening, is really to just pray, to get us started on the right foot. So come with me, pray with me, I know some of you might have different belief systems and uh, different ways of thinking about God, but I grew up in a uh, Baptist church and uh, I, just walk with me through this part and I ask that you would uh, pray with me. With that being said, Heavenly Father, most gracious God, we give you thanks and we honor you for you alone are worthy to be praised. God, we thank you. As we begin to celebrate this Black History Month, we remember our faithful ancestors. We hold fast to the fact that you were with them through it all. You have gone before us and you have gone with us. We thank you for those beautiful ancestors who built the pyramids and started universities. But Father, also the messiness of the countless people who are lost in the Middle Passage during the transatlantic slave trade. God, we ask that you would be with us today, that you would be a part of our celebration, that you would uh, find yourself even in this weird place during COVID to just be with us, whether that's on a Zoom call, whether it's on YouTube, whatever way or media that we were receiving this, that you would be with us. We thank you for those who survived Middle Passage. We thank you for those who fought for our freedoms. We thank you for those who found the, their way into this land and fought. We thank you for Nat Turner's, we, for the Harriet Tubman's, the Sojourner Truths, the Frederick Douglasses, the George Washington Carvers, the Marcus Garvey's, the Fannie Lou Hamer's, the Malcolm X's, and of course, our Martin Luther King Jr. We honor you, oh God, for, th for their service, for their sacrifice, and just who they've been. So we promise you that their suffering and that their labor is not in vain. We thank you for this opportunity to celebrate today. Faithful God, we come to you calling for life, racial justice, healing, and transformation. 
God, we stand in solidarity with the many Black bodies that fell victim to violence and death in this past few years. We will remember to say a few names because there are so, so many. One name that we won't forget is Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, Michael Brown, Stephon Clark, Philando Castile, Ahmad Arbery, George Floyd, and for some of us here in the Bay Area, Mario Woods. We pray that you would step in, God, that you would begin to continue to dismantle systems and structures that continue to hold Black people from experiencing abundant life, the life that you want for us. We commit ourselves, oh God, in this new season of celebration and remembrance for the struggle for justice, for peace. We vow to stay in the fight until oppression and dehumanization is no more. We ask for your divine healing for the many who are in hospital beds today because of COVID. We pray for the families of the many who have lost their lives due to this virus. I ask that you would comfort us today, be with us today. We call for your justice, your equity, your equality, your love, and your shalom, your peace, oh God, so we can bring our full selves to the table. Jesus, our Savior, our holy ancestor, and our liberator, we pray today. Thank you, and God bless.
now have greetings from the mayor of the city and county of San Francisco, the Honorable London Nicole Breed, and from the president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, the Honorable Shimon Walton. Good afternoon. As we kick off Black History Month, I'm reminded of how over the course of history, we have come together to celebrate every step forward, every obstacle we have overcome. This month, I'm thinking about that history, about how not so long ago in City Hall, where we traditionally hold this ceremony, a black woman reporter was prohibited from entering our hollowed board chambers. I'm thinking about Selma, where last year thousands walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge alongside the great John Lewis, a man who was once beaten on that very bridge for having the audacity to demand equal rights for African Americans. I'm thinking of the White House, where a little over a decade ago, millions celebrated the first black president, Barack Obama, making his home in a place that was first built by slaves. This is our history. It's who we are. Every time we step forward, we are reminded of all that we have overcome. And while during this month, it is so important that we honor our past, we can never take our eyes off the future. And for that future, I have real hope. I have hope because of the resilience that exists in our hearts, the culture and joy we share even during our most difficult times. Whether during the challenges caused by this devastating pandemic, or the painful but righteous cause for racial justice after the murder of George Floyd. I have hope that we will rise stronger and more resilient than ever. Here in San Francisco, that hope is built on the historic investments we are making. $120 million diverted from law enforcement to invest in the black community. So we can lift up the next generation and make real change. And across this country, that hope is built on the new leadership in this country with our first black female vice president, Kamala Harris, who along with President Biden in just the first few weeks since the inauguration has shown us what it means to put equity and justice first. So yes, I have hope for the future and you should too. These are hard times. But out of the fire of this moment, we will rise to a better and brighter tomorrow. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce someone who has been fighting for San Francisco for decades. We're grateful for all the work she has done to move our country forward with a focus on equity and justice for all. Please join me in welcoming Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Thank you, Mayor London Breed, for that kind introduction and for all that you do for the people of San Francisco every day. It is an honor to send greetings during Black History Month to President Al Williams and all the brilliant community leaders and advocates at the San Francisco African American Historical and Cultural Society's kickoff event. Since 1955, the Society has been a leading voice in celebrating the innumerable contributions and vibrant history of San Francisco's beautiful, diverse Black community, whose courage and patriotism has strengthened and enriched our city and our nation. We take special pride this year in celebrating our own Bay Area trailblazer, Vice President Kamala Harris, the first Black woman Vice President in American history. Sadly, we also mark Black History Month and a staggering COVID-19 pandemic continues to inflict a devastating disproportionate toll on the health and economic stability of communities of color. Despite this challenge, we have been inspired by the countless young Black leaders, activists, and dedicated citizens in San Francisco and everywhere who have marched, mobilized, and are making a difference to demand action, advance justice, and build a brighter future for all. Guided by their resilience and persistence, Congress continues to fight for robust emergency relief for Bay Area families. In these efforts, we are committed to equality and justice, ensuring families, schools, and minority-owned businesses the hardest hit um, uh, that they have the resources to build back better. This Black History Month let us reflect on the challenges of the past year 
as we lift up the beautiful legacy and bright future of the Black community in San Francisco and in every community. Let us also draw faith and inspiration from the closing words of Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem, where there is always light if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. Together we will defeat the virus, protect our most vulnerable families, and renew our nation's bedrock promise of justice, equality, and opportunity as we continue to insist on the truth that Black lives matter. Thank you for the honor of representing you in Washington. On behalf of the United States Congress, thank you, San Francisco African American Historical and Cultural Society, for preserving and sharing our city's cherished history as you educate and inspire future generations. Thank you. First of all, I just wanna say I'm excited to celebrate another Black History Month with the African American Cultural and Historical Society here in San Francisco. As you know, the first Friday in February, we always come together and have a big celebration in City Hall to talk about all of the great attributes of Black people, not only here in the United States, but here in San Francisco. As the president of the Board of Supervisors here in San Francisco, I just wanna say happy Black History Month, and I'm excited about what we're going to be able to accomplish in 2021. As you know, Mayor Breed and I set aside $120 million over the next two years for the Black community. We also are working on making sure that our working group for reparations is complete over the next couple of months. They will decide where the resources are gonna go and prioritize how we get reparations into the black community here in San Francisco. There's a lot of work to do to make sure we achieve equity here in San Francisco as a black community. And I just wanna say, it's amazing to be able to celebrate you. Once we get through this pandemic and we can come back together I'm gonna make sure that we all have a celebration worthy of us as black folks here in the city. Thank you again to the African-American History and Cultural Society here in San Francisco. Thank you, Mayor Breed and Supervisor Walton. Next, the Third Baptist Church Singers will share with us their rendition of This Little Light of Mine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This the light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This the light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This the light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Give me 
Jesus. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce today's keynote speaker, Charles M. Chuck Collins, Esquire. He is truly a Renaissance man. Mr. Collins' interests, contributions, and accomplishments are legendary. Let me just share a few highlights with you. Mr. Collins is currently the President Emeritus of the YMCA of San Francisco and a special advisor to the current president and CEO. He was himself president and CEO from 2004 to 2020. As you may know, the YMCA of San Francisco is a nonprofit organization. It has a $100 million annual budget. During Mr. Collins's tenure as president and CEO, the YMCA grew to 2,400 employees and over 2,000 volunteers. They served at that time over 183,000 children and adults. From 1983 to 2002, Mr. Collins was president and chairman of WDG Vincers. WDG was engaged in real estate development. Signature development projects included the Metreon and the Four Seasons Hotel and Condos. Mr. Collins practiced law and was a former deputy secretary of the Business Transportation and Housing Agency for the state of California. He serves on a number of boards and commissions, including the San Francisco Art Commission. In his spare time, he's authored The African Americans, colon, A Celebration of Achievement, and was the senior editor of A Day in the Life of Africa. With that, I give you our keynote speaker, Charles M. Chuck Collins, Esquire. Good day. I'm Charles Collins, and I'm a citizen of San Francisco. Good day and thanks to all, but a special Thanks to Mayor Lyndon Breed for her gifted leadership of this great city and for her courage in fulfilling her oath of office to support, protect, and defend our community through these challenging and uncharted times. May God bless our mayor and harbor her in the arms of our Lord, keeping her safe as she keeps all of us safe from the enemies, foreign and domestic. And again, special thanks to Al Williams and to the board of and the leadership of the African American Historical and Cultural Society, who have organized the celebration of Black History Month, as well as the African American Art and Culture Complex, whose leaders are Melanie Green and Meloria Green, and their talented staff, board, and community stakeholders, the home for the AAAC. As a part of the cultural centers of this. San Francisco Arts Commission, 
The African American arts and cultural complex provides leadership along with other sister and brother neighborhood centers, the American Indian, the Asian Pacific Islander, Bayview Opera House, the Mission, Queer, and Somarts to form an interlinked network which helps strengthen the ecology of our San Francisco through the arts. As an arts commissioner, I want to thank Mayor Breed for the opportunity to serve the city in this capacity. I also want to thank and congratulate Supervisor Shaman Walton in his history-making election as the first African-American male to serve as the president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. I'm a native son of San Francisco. I was born here in the Fillmore District in 1947 into a family of immigrants. My parents were here along with thousands of other African Americans in the early 1940s to support our World War II efforts to win the war and to create a just and lasting peace against fascism in Europe and in Asia. That threatened world order. We lived for many years on Pine Street and my father's office was just a few blocks away on Sutter and Divisadero streets. My father was recruited to the University of California at San Francisco to teach in the Department of Dentistry and to train medical personnel deployed for the war. Like many others, my parents came here as a part of the Great Migration that was so well documented by Isabel Wilkerson in her book, The Warmth of Other Sons. People that came from the South and who worked in the machinery of the war to build ships, munitions, and all of the resources necessary to win the war. We lived amid a community that bore the impacts of the Japanese Americans being placed into concentration camps during the war and who returned home in a changing neighborhood. Redevelopment would, have a, would be harsh to the Japanese and black communities of the Western edition. Redevelopment broke the ties and bonds that so much were needed to hold the community together. But together we held. And years later, and after other careers that I had in law and government and real estate development, I spent the next two decades of my life working for the YMCA of San Francisco as the president and chief executive officer. Over these years, we built the Y into a social enterprise addressing deep and systemic community needs with a vision that all children, all children should be given agency to reach their highest potential by strengthening the foundations of communities through families and neighborhoods with social responsibility and youth development at our core. I owe a deep grit of gratitude to the Y for allowing me to work side by side and shoulder to shoulder with so many people in this great city, in our region, our nation, and around the world. This story of, of migration to California recalls prior centuries when millions of Africans were enslaved and brought to the New World in the Americas and in the Caribbean to work and to rebuild this land, our country. It was this labor, whether as slaves or as free, that built upon this land the foundations upon which we stand today. And it is our duty to continue to build upon and strengthen these investments by our forebears, by honoring their sacrifices and commitments to our own work as a measure of our devotion to their labor in bringing forth this country. Black History Month is all about celebrating and commemorating and honoring our past while dedicating and recommitting ourselves to the work of the now and the future. It is about examining the past with an eye towards the future. It is about raising the histories of our people and all of those who have labored through this journey to here, to now, where we take this stand. The stand that we must take is standing at the threshold of what many people call the third founding of our country. It's an experiment in what it means to say for liberty and justice for all.
If the first founding of the United States began on July 4th, 1776, with the Declaration of Independence from British rule, the seeds were then sown to figure out the founders' original intention that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Remember, these words were written by Thomas Jefferson. It has often been said that this is one of the best-known phrases in the English language. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But where do these words actually derive? When did Thomas Jefferson first articulate this sentence at the dawn of the first founding of the American experiment in democracy, that all men are created equal? Well, let me refer to you. And let me pause for you to take a pen out and write this down. A 27-year-old Thomas Jefferson first inscribed this famous phrase six years earlier in a case that he argued in Howell versus Netherland, a Virginia case about a child of an interracial marital union. Decided in April of 1770, Jefferson argued that under the laws of nature, all men are born free and that everyone comes into this world with a right for his own person. Samuel Howe was the child of a racially mixed union, and he fought his case for freedom against Netherland, the holder of his indentured servitude. Samuel Howe's case against Netherland was lost though the famous words in this case endure and echo throughout American history. This certainly seems to contradict the facts that Jefferson was a notorious slaveholder himself. And it's in itself, it, it reveals the inherent challenge in what we are struggling for, that all men are created equal. And what would that mean over the course of American history? That very person, that very Samuel Howell, was my great-great-great-granduncle many generations ago in my family history. Samuel Howell is one of the great examples of Black people who have challenged what it meant to be human and free in America. This is my family, a Black family, who have fought for, since the beginning of this country for the full measure of human freedom and self-determination. The second founding of America is well documented by Eric Froner in his deep analysis of how the United States wrestled with the inherent flaw in our founders' idea of who would be granted freedom and personhood under our Constitution. It would take the victory of the Civil War and the passage and the ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, as well as the first Civil Rights Act of 1866 that defines citizenship and affirmed that all citizens are protected under the law and to enlarge who is protected under the framework of the Constitution of the United States of America. This has been coined the second founding because it widened the scope of constitutional and legal protections of citizenship to include former slaves and indentured servitudes. No, this has been coined the second founding of the United States because it widened the scope of constitutional and legal protections of citizenship to in include all former slaves and indentured servants. Many now observe that we, in this moment, may be at the dawn of the third founding of the United States. This third founding is what President Obama calls the promise, the potential, and the hope that America can fulfill and expand its dream that all are created equal and can live with justice and equity in all sectors of our society. 
Perhaps this is what we're beginning to witness in these uncharted times. Just as in 1770 with Samuel Howell, or in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, or in the 1860s with the Civil War and the ensuing three constitutional amendments and the expansions they provided, then under the 19th Amendment with women a few years later, that now on their very own stand as persons and citizens of the United States. And our very own Kamala D. Harris today is the Vice President of the United States of America. And isn't this testimony to the long arc towards justice that we reflect as Black people in America? Black people and Black families have been at the very core and the heart of the American experience and the experiment of democracy and justice. This third founding could be the next journey to fully recognize and to acknowledge our contributions to the foundations of this country from slavery to the White House. It has been on the shoulders of black people and black families that this nation was founded and has grown and that now faces itself and the world as a beacon of freedom and liberty. And Black History Month celebrates the past with an eye to now and into the future. Fundamental values that we brought here from Africa with our ancestry endure today. The dignity of family is the foundation of social order. The respect of elders and the necessity of a collective definition of personhood. I am because we are. There is no me or I without us and we. And centuries of slavery and marginalization cannot and have not erased these fundamental social and family values. 250 years ago, my forefather, Samuel Howell, a black man, stood before the court of Virginia to declare his freedom. And today, at the dawn of the third founding of the United States, we are seeing that the past is yielding to the truth of the American promise and the ideal that all humans are created and are entitled to dignity before the law of this country and that all of the rights, duties, and privileges appertaining thereto are a part of being a person and a citizen of the United States. In holding that these truths are self-evident, we cannot just stand by and assume that they will hold against the attempts to undermine our country. The third founding is not promised. It must be fought for and earned so that the true measure of this promise is accomplished by digging deeply to ensuring that these values and principles are sown deeply into the soil of this country and into every community, and into every neighborhood, and into every household, family, and child. Freedom and democracy and justice are not yet true entitlements. They must be fought for and protected by each generation as we continue to develop and unfold as a nation. The very nature of our existence as Blacks and African Americans has been both a threat to and a promise of freedom, liberty, justice, and democracy. As we celebrate Black History Month here in San Francisco, let us reflect on how we have challenged this country while simultaneously contributed to the very things that make this great city and country even greater. And as we face what lies ahead, we must speak truth into what is before us. Black and brown people, BIPOC, all of us have been disproportionately impacted by the four corners of the now. The social determinants of health, education, economic security, and physical security and safety have long impacted our communities. The history of slavery and lynching and economic marginalization and legal discrimination by governments at all levels have often shuttered opportunity in our communities. We pray for the lives 
that have been lost to the COVID pandemic in just one year. That we see the devastation that has been wrought by this virus in upsetting the health, education, and economic security of our communities. We have been through a year of knees on the necks of black men, suffocating their lives, and of police storming into the home of a totally innocent young woman whose killing was emblematic of that that is wrong in policing and civil rights. These events further reveal the pandemic of systemic racism endemic throughout our history and throughout our country. We have witnessed the last president of the United States continually lying to the public, yet inspiring simultaneously millions to cause violent insurrection against we the people. That is only the tip of the iceberg of the venom that is spewing in our land. We have witnessed unparalleled economic insecurity spawned by the lack of a unified and coordinated response by the federal government that has left the states, counties, and municipalities to cope with all of the aspects of the pandemic almost on their own. We cannot ignore the impacts of climate change as we saw last summer on the day the sun never was seen, as unbreathable smoke from raging fires fell to the earth and into our lungs. So much of this brokenness in our country was revealed last year. Yet these events turned despair into determination and hope into action as our determination for a more perfect union was revealed through this country, and especially in Georgia, where the victory for democracy was planted in the red clay of the South. Out of all of this lies perhaps the roadmap of the future, perhaps a better future, by recommitting to our deep founding principles, regardless of the darkened skies. We must pledge our allegiance to freedom and dignity. We must take the oath to support and defend the highest ideals of humanity. We must promise that equity be instilled in everything, like the blood in our bodies. We must take sacred vows to speak truth against lies and to challenge all threats to a just and inclusive society with our actions, with our work and with our good old San Francisco values. As Mayor Breed has often said, we are the core and the home of the resistance. We resist the thought that America is a failed state and cannot uphold its core values. We resist the hypocrisy and the false narratives and the clear and imminent danger that they pose to civil society. And at the dawn of Black History Month in San Francisco, let us promise that our creative and innovative nature built upon our past and our resistance to falsehoods will usher forth the true measure of justice in our times. I wanna thank Mayor Breed, I wanna thank President Shaman Walton, Al Williams and all of those who have so generously contributed to this celebration. It is truly an honor for me to share with you these thoughts as we look forward with our deepest commitment to honor those in our past who have fought so hard to give us this great moment in history and the potential of the third founding of our land. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May God bless you and thank you again. Chuck, thank you so much for those inspiring, informative, and thought-provoking remarks. You've certainly given us a great deal to think about and reflect on in the days and months ahead. It's now my pleasure to introduce one of my colleagues on the Society's Board of Directors, 
who also serves as our executive director and has curated many of the society's exhibits over the years, Dr. Bill Hoskins. Dr. Hoskins will share with us information about the other programs the society will be hosting during this Black History Month. Bill? Greetings and again, welcome to the 2021 Black History Month kickoff event. I not only want to welcome you again to the Black History 2021 kickoff at City Hall, but I would also like to encourage all of you who are not a member to become a member of the African American Historical and Cultural Society. The Society is a membership-driven 501c3 tax-free organization. It is the oldest of its kind west of the Mississippi, founded in 1955. The Society is committed to collecting, preserving, and presenting accounts of African-American contributions via thought, history, and culture to the city of San Francisco and beyond. Without your support, we will not be able to continue to meet our commitments to you, to our committee, or to our city. Membership is open to all who support this mission. This opening event for Black History Month will be followed by events scheduled throughout the month of February. Special events are scheduled for February 12th, 19th and the 20th. A virtual exhibit featuring Bay Area artists addressing Black History Month theme for 21, the Black Family, is also being done. The opening date for the exhibit would be shared at a later time. The following brief clips are designed to highlight the upcoming special Zoom programs. February 12th, a family history presentation featuring Ginger Smiley and Lewis Garrett. February 16th, a genealogy workshop featuring Ginger Smiley. And February 26th, a public affairs forum featuring Al Williams. These short clip presentations would be followed with closing comments from President Al Williams. In my closing, I would like to thank Ms. Hilda Robinson for the use of her beautiful artwork and to thank you for sharing this special time with us. Family history is about stories and relationships. Genealogy is about collecting dates, places, and relations. Genealogy not only gives us clues, but facts about our ancestry, who we come from a generation ago, 200 years ago, 400 years ago, and so on. African Americans now more than ever can uncover answers to these questions and more. Join the society as we uncover the larger Black family, February 20th at 11 o'clock. The family offers a rich tapestry for understanding the African-American past and present. The Black family knows no single location having spread across nations and continents. Its genetic ancestry shows its diversity and its many journeys. The Black family provides identity in all its representations. Understanding one's family history enriches our collective understanding of ourselves. Join us on Friday, February 12th at 6 p.m as we explore the meaning of Black family history, how to collect it, and how to tell your own story. Thank you, Bill. As I mentioned, Bill is our resident curator. He's working on a virtual exhibit that will open in April. That exhibit will feature the work of Hilda Robinson and several other local artists. 
paintings by Ms. Robinson that you will see shortly will be included in that exhibit. Thanks also to board members Ginger Smiley and Lewis Garrett Sr. for sharing their family histories. Ms. Smiley will also be conducting our genealogy workshop. Later this year, board member Marisa Williams will be working with Citizen Film to produce a film on this year's theme. Last but not least, we'd like to thank our sponsors and our partners without whose support this program and the work we do throughout the year would not be possible. We hope you've enjoyed today's program. We look forward to seeing you at the Family History Program on February 12th, the Genealogy Workshop on February 20th, and the Public Affairs Forum on February 26th. Until then, please be safe, maintain social distance, wash your hands frequently, and of course, wear your mask. <laughs>